start off with, are there any questions? I have one question, please. What is verbal delusion? Ah, what is verbal delusion? <coughs> I should, uh, could make a comment about uh, politicians. <laughs> you see, according to the psychology of Patanjali, the mind is a mind stuff actually, very pliable. We know its pliability and we know how well it can be conditioned, but it erupts, it has waves. You can imagine a kind of lake, if you will, and erupts in a stormy condition, and these waves form five varieties. So verbal delusion is the wrong association with what is being told. You get the wrong end of the stick, as it were. A misunderstanding occurs and creates a reaction. Now, many of our negative reactions are due to verbal delusion, where we misunderstand something. Of course, the greatest verbal delusion we have is the continuous script that this world is our reality. And Vedanta tells us it's not. It says, Asutoma sat gamaya, tamasoma jyoti gamaya, pratyo amritam gamaya, lead us from the unreal to the real, from darkness to light, from death to immortality. So we have to make this transition. And it's easy to understand the principle of it, but for the emotions to catch up with it is a difficulty. But to help us along, <clears throat> this Bhagavad Gita has told us a number of important things. So in the 10th chapter, we find there's a recognition of an entity that pervades everything. And, uh, makes it, we can make this our own when we understand it. It shows us that uh, it's firstly in the gross things that we see, and then it's in the subtle things that we see, and then it's the simple things that we see, and then the complex things that we see, or that we hear about. So uh, we're about to commence the 11th chapter, actually. But coming back to the question of verbal delusion a little bit before we proceed. You see, we're constantly talking to ourselves and listening to ourselves. The only person who talks and listens to ourselves is ourselves. <laughs> we don't have to listen to somebody else. We have enough going on inside. From the minute we get up to the minute we go to bed, mind is babbling away, sometimes coherently, sometimes incoherently. But every word has a corresponding concept, corresponding association. So there can be one word and then we get the wrong idea, understanding. In Zimbabwe, there was a true story. There was a, a man who went to his insurance agent, or I think it was a lawyer actually, and he and his wife were supposed to have gone there. And the lawyer asks, where is your wife? And he says, oh, she's late. Yes, I know she's late. Where is she? I just told you she's late. And then the discussion gets really heated. <laughs> it 
turns out she was deceased. <laughs> the late Mrs. So and so. See how we can get the wrong end of the stick, the wrong understanding. So somebody says something and we orientate it toward our particular point of view. That's a peculiarity we humans have. Something comes up, comes into our field of vision, as it were, our field of awareness, and immediately we respond from our compulsed area. My famous example is when somebody walks in the office, good morning, the person says, what do you mean by that? What are you trying to infer? <laughs> so it all comes essentially from this ego. When I say ego, I mean egoism. A sense that we are this embodied entity. But what we know is that this universe is projected, as it were, from a spark of the divine. A mere fraction of a fraction of a cosmic self. So, we have this uh, beautiful statement finishing off the 10th chapter, as we must. Yachapi sarva bhutanam bijam dat aham arjuna. Bijam from a seed, I am the seed. And whatever is the seed of all beings that I am. It's a wonderful summary statement before we launch into this 11th chapter. There is no being, whether moving or unmoving, that can exist without me. We are understand what the things are that move. But there's a vast array of things that we can't see moving. And the optical illusion, of course, is when you look into the sky, you think the moon is moving, but it's the clouds that are moving. We put a projection onto it. But there's a vast area that seems to be not moving. There's a vast area that seems to be moving. And people have studied the astronomical aspect of the sky for thousands and thousands of years and have noticed that it moves something moves. Of course you can interpret whether it's the earth that moves or whether it's the sky that moves. For many years it was understood the sky moves. But uh, the ancient interpretation in some cultures was that we had, the sky was an area around the earth and what was the occupants there were all the deities moving things, pushing things around. This was not the understanding of ancient India. We see this very clearly in the 11th chapter. We see overall the wonderful presentation of the universe as the Lord himself. Now everything has a beginning, has a seed. And the fantastic thing about a seed is it contains a potentiality. It unfolds. This is where we get the whole concept of evolution from. And as I've said, in many a talk before, our concept of evolution is different from the neo-Darwinian evolutionary understanding. First of all, that's 20th century biology, encapsulated in a book, The Selfish Gene, by Richard Dawkins, in 1976, but it's now very old. It no longer holds true. 21st biology is much more revealing, and to do that, we have to engage physiology. Because it's the physiology people who will notice the functionality of cells. And in noticing these things, we understand the random element so endorsed by neo darwinian evolution is not there. It's more like a cooperative, it's more like a network of cooperative forces and functions that work together in some kind of synergy and produces a movement forward. Movement forward means a response to the environment which is our, to our advantage. What is called survival is just a movement forward to our advantage, but it's an unfolding. It's like a seed unfolds and evolves into a tree. And the story doesn't end there. Another seed is begotten and so on. 
But what is the entire seed of the whole universe and universal existence? I am that, declares the Lord. I am the seed, and therefore I am also the universe. Just as if you say there's a seed to an oak tree, then you can't divorce seed from the oak tree. The seed is exactly the same. Let's take any other seed. Let's take a reproductive seed. You can't say that the reproductive seed and the egg that matches it goes nowhere. No, the conj conjunction creates a zygote and that evolves. It grows and we can see and measure the growth. How it grows, we don't know, but here's the answer. I am the seed. That means I'm within the seed. That means I'm with everything, within everything. So if modern cosmology has the idea that the universe or space is expanding and to understand its origin, we have to go back in the movie and find out some kind of a rich origin point. We can call this a seed, if you will. Something like uh, what is technically called Hiranyagarbha, a golden seed, a golden womb. How important is this to understand, for our understanding? It's important because when we suffer from this verbal delusion, or any other kind of delusion, we can quickly correct our vision by a correct understanding, a true understanding of the nature of things. And it gives us an insight. Wait, where does everything come from? And where is it unfolding? And what is it unfolding? It's unfolding <coughs> nothing more than this very seed and origin. So it may be summed up that the varieties of existence is at all levels that you can think of, physical, psychological, in any dimension you like to think of, and moving and unmoving, both varieties of their all existences. Unmoving example is seems to be an insentient rock, but when you look at it closely, it also is moving. In fact, the rock that we call the earth itself is moving, but we're completely unaware of it. To the extent that our interpretation is it's the sky that's moving in the ancient days. <clears throat> Nothing can exist without me, says the Lord. It says, both the, the uh, charachalam, the moving or the unmoving, everything is developed, uh, developed uh, dependent on maya, everything is by me. So when we talk in theology of a divine will, we're also talking this way. Birth like death, we have no idea when it will take place, but one guarantee, a hard, cold fact, is it what you call the body? And if you happen to be attached to this embodied thing, you have a difficulty. Because this body will one day be as cold and hard as ice. And people will put it in a mortuary and they'll take it out and all the heat will have gone. And the wonderful question, of course, that man has contemplated for generations and eons is, what is this thing that is called life? Now there was a man called Owen Schrodinger, famous pioneer of quantum physics in the early days of the 20th century, who gives a remarkable series of lectures at Trinity College here in Dublin. And this series of lectures compiled into this book, What is Life? And there he makes a prediction, very, very astute and incisive an insightful prediction. He predicts the existence of what we finally discovered as DNA, this organic blueprint, which he puts in a crystalline form, but that was a common idea. Even uh, you know, the uh, Watson and Crick also put that in that same kind of structure, crystalline structure. But it doesn't really explain how it arrives, why it arrives, and why it leaves. This is still a mystery to us. How is it that you are completely healthy one day? And it's difficult. The following day, of course, we know sometimes what the causes are, but sometimes we don't. And of course, it's very obvious if a truck is heading to you, to you, it's obvious what the cause is there. But the body is very fragile. 
somebody we shouldn't take it for granted. And it's all dependent on this divine will. Nothing can exist without me. And it's necessary to have birth, life and death. We'll come on to this shortly when we deal with the 11th chapter. And then finally, Nantosti Mama Divyanam Viputnam Paramtapa Esha Tu Desha Taha Prakto Viputa Vistaromaya There is no end of my divine manifestations. Oh, Harris, as he puts it, this is only a brief exposition by me of the extent of my glories. And all these weeks we've been studying this 10th chapter and we've found almost no extent to these glories. And he says, this is only a brief exposition of my glories. Sri Ramakrishna has this to say, who can know Ishwara in its entirety? That power and privilege are not given to us. Again, it's not necessary that we know his infinitude. As our understanding permits, it is enough if we know him alone to be the real. Let it be supposed that one wants to see the Ganga and have a holy dip in it. But plodding along from Gangotri to Gangasava, the length and breadth of the Ganga, that is from the source to the estuary, it need not be gone through the whole thing. Just a sample of water is necessary. Contact with the sacred river at any convenient spot serves the purpose because the water at the beginning, the water in the middle, the water at the end, the water at any point you select is this same water. So we can pick any example we like in order to elevate the mind and inspire us and start from any point. This was the purport of the 10th chapter. So how does the knower of God view the world as opposed to how does a so-called ordinary person view the world? Yet yet vibhuti mat sattvam shrimad varjitam evava tatad eva vagachatam nama tejom shashambam Whatever being there is, glorious, prosperous or powerful, know that to have sprung but from a spark of my splendor. We're not judging whether it's good or bad, by the way. You can see how some very powerful speakers who are known to be the scourge of humanity held people in a mesmerized way. There's great power. Meditation doesn't guarantee goodness. But all it guarantees is the power of concentration. And with that power of things, you have insight and things are mobilized. <coughs> so we know this also <coughs> from many mythological stories. Vishwamitra, for example, is a point in case where all his endeavors were there to become powerful. But he never succeeded because purity of mind was not there. Purity of mind means the absence of an egocentric position. So the difficulty with the exercise of power is egocentricity. Supposing I have the power to read all your minds, then uh, firstly, you can imagine all this input like babble coming in all in one go. It might not be in my favor. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> and you'd no doubt be embarrassed of all your thoughts. Yeah. No doubt you are. But you see, we have to have purity of mind. Jesus could walk on water according to the stories in the gospel. Jesus could hear, heal the sick according to the gospels in the story. Jesus could raise the dead to life according to the story. Imagine if you have all these powers, and the yogis have identified a number of these powers, these siddhis. So imagine if you have all these powers, but don't have purity of mind, then you'll misuse them, and you'll go into the circus profession <laughs> and get a lot of money. So there was uh, some time back, somebody, who and they know who they are probably, said, Oh, there's this person, but you know, he must be authentic and credible since 
He has this great power. What is that power? He can heal people without touching them. He can lay people on a bed, and then he digs in. Somebody, somebody has an appendix problem or something. He can then manipulate, you see, and then bring out these bits and pieces, blood-soaked pieces, put them in a tray, and the person gets up and is cured. Now, if you're any, in any way skeptical, you can easily find out it's just a trick. But we lay so much importance on this power. And the great Houdini challenged all the spiritualists of the day. He said, anything I can do, anything you can do, I can do. And you may say it's spiritualism, but I'm saying it's by illusion, just by a kind of magic trickery. You won't know how I do it, but I'll reproduce exactly the same thing. So we are sucked into this idea about power, and significantly Gautama Siddhartha, the great Buddha, eschewed all these powers. Sri Ramakrishna eschewed all these powers, even for himself, spat them out as mere filth. So if we have these powers, we also have these temptations, potential temptations, and then we can misuse them. So we have evidence everywhere of these great, great manifestations of divine Shakti. Inexplicably, a mass movement where people are conjoined together in one mind somehow moves our heart, moves us to tears in some cases. Sometimes the heat of arrogance can stir our blood to arrogance. And we have many examples in the 20th century where this has happened, where charismatic people can stir up the emotions of many. So we're not judging whether it's good or evil. You find the extraordinary talent of some singers and musicians have the capacity to move us and move many, many people, thousands upon thousands of people. All of this is a manifestation of Shakti. Wherever we see any power, it's only divine power. It doesn't belong to us. It doesn't belong to another either. It has nothing to do with them. It is all tapping in to this universal power, this cosmic energy which is only one. <clears throat> so, for example, the sun's rays spread everywhere, it reveals things in their true perspective. The revealing light here is different from the things revealed. The sun is one thing, the things it reveals is another. But God is self-revealed, there's the difference, self-luminous. He manifests himself as everything, as everything, as glory, as brilliance, as splendor, as beauty, as power, and so many other divine attributes. We may agree or disagree with somebody who exhibits this charisma, but one thing we have to do is find it comes from God. And therefore we have to understand that it gives us a way of seeing the power behind it. So whatever catches our imagination or draws our attention, sends us into raptures and infuses bliss into us. And that is none but the glory of God. Everybody must have been moved <coughs> by music of some kind. Everybody must have been used by mass, uh, moved by mass movements in some way. Everybody must have been moved by a generosity of spirit that we find exhibited in humanity. Whether they are religious or non-religious, <coughs> those people who have the capacity to use their power and uplift humanity, these move us the most. So a question arises then, is it to be inferred that the sum total of the manifested universe and God are one and the same? It's a good question. Is this just dual? Is this fragmented? Is it a multiple, multiple universe? Or is there a unity that sits there? And then we come to this then. Atava bohunaite nakim jyate naratava archana vishtabhyaham idam kratsnam ekam shena astito jakat. 
What need is there, O Arjun, for all this detailed knowledge? You can read a thousand books on something. What need is there for it? You can make a thousand intellectual observations. What need is there? You can look at the detail in, uh, of uh, somebody's achievement. You can look at every single atom in the universe. You can look at every single molecule, every drop of water. What good is that? I stand, he says, supporting the whole universe. And here's a wonderful thing. With a single fragment of myself. Our problem is we can't see the sum totality. You see the example I gave, I often give, of the professor lowering the cone into a water, into the water, where intellectual university educated frogs sit trying to establish what is a cone, but being dimensionally deficient. So they can't look up, they can't look down. They can only look horizontally. And so the first thing they see is a point. And then they see an expansion, as it were, an evolution in time and space. And then they see a pot belly. And then they see another big circle. Expansion, expansion, expansion. Eventually the cone disappears. Not one of them saw or was able to see the sum totality of it. Because the sum totality doesn't evolve in time, doesn't evolve in space. It was always the cone. It was always the totality. That's a significant example of the blind people who go to explore the elephant. This is there in Hindu stories, there in Buddhist stories and so on, there in the Jataka tales and so on. Very famous. So famous, nobody knows where they, the story came from, but everybody seems to use it. <coughs> so blind people went to explore the elephant and they made a report. Oh, the elephant is like a big pillar because he only felt the leg. Oh, it's like a rope. He only felt the tail. Oh, it's like a big plantain leaf. He only um, felt the ear. And so it goes on. You can give so many examples, you know. But not one of them saw the totality. That's the problem. Now, the story has a small twist to it. Supposing you're sighted, you still won't see the totality. Because when you see the elephant, it infers a space beyond it. And whatever limitation or whatever limited thing that the visual accessing reports to you, whatever confine you have in terms of name and form, whatever spatial confine you have, whatever temporal confine you have, whatever instrument provides you with a limited interpretation that you have, will never show you the sum totality and will give you an interpretation of it. So your interpretation of the universe is very different from the interpretation of a beetle, for example, who crawls along and only, only knows what's in front. And he takes great delight in gathering dung and then making a nice ball and rolling it along. It's a wonderful spectacle, endlessly doing it. So an expert cannot display all his talents when you're tied to a gunny bag and made to run. And though the Lord reveals himself in many forms, these revelations are but partial. All manifestations are, in fact, limitations. The waves are mere insignificant aspects of the ocean. Even so, the infinite phenomenal expressions of Ishwara are all just a negligible speck in his great magnitude, unfathomable magnitude, actually. When this itself is unfathomable, then what to speak of him as the unmanifest. So Sri Ramakrishna makes this small comment. <coughs> what we call God is with form, without form, and also transcending all these. He knows alone who and what he is. Iti Srimad Bhagavad Gita Supanishad Su Brahma Vidya Yam Yoga Shastri Sri Jaya Krishna Arjan Samvari Vibhuti Yoga Nama Dashamo in the Supanishad of the Bhagavad Gita, knowledge of Brahman Supreme, science of yoga, dialogue between Sri Krishna and Arjun. This is the tenth discourse designated the yoga of divine manifestations and the 
Sanskrit Vibhuti Yoga. So that brings us then to a brand new chapter, Vishwarupa Darshana Yoga. That is the yoga of the vision of cosmic form. So far we've only heard of the divine manifestations. But you see, Arjuna now wants something more. He wants to see more of this totality. He wants to see the visible manifestations, lock, stock and barrel. He wants to see the entire elephant. And this is a very rare thing that we can get. Because according to this, in the whole history of mankind, only Arjuna has, granted, has been granted this. And we can see how the Lord loves Arjuna. After all, in the 10th chapter he says, that of all of these, of all of these brothers, he is Arjuna of all the wielders of weapons and so on. He identifies himself with Arjun. That's how much he loves him. And so therefore, naturally, he may well concede for good or ill, because there's a consequence. When we think of God, most people, devotees, like to think of God in a very benign aspect. We like to think that God is love and that's it. But we've just learned that this is unfathomable and inscrutable also. And so, beware, this cosmic form is about to be revealed and you may not like all of it. <laughs> but you see, there's a theological difficulty that many religions may have. How do you explain the existence of so-called evil? How do you explain the existence of unfortunate so-called things that happen? From a human perspective, we judge it in this way. How do you explain that there is birth, life and death? Most people don't like the death part. And many people don't like the life part also. <laughs> With the birth, life, people seem to enjoy this the most. In between, not so much. But we don't know what happened. We don't know our, the origin. We didn't experience it by direct perception. We're not going to see where the end is. We're trying to figure out what's in the middle. So, Arjun makes a supplication, and this chapter is a response to it. He wants to have a vision, and to have this special eye of intuition is necessary. This has to be granted. Don't think that you do it yourself. It's all the divine grace that responds to this yearning. But be careful what you ask for. So, we find that Ishwara <coughs> has a cosmic form. This whole universe is that. There's a wonderful, two suktas are there. One is the Narayana sukta, and the one is the Purusha sukta. Both of these say pretty much the same thing. Purusha means a person. This whole universe is this person. This whole universe is his body. Now supposing you don't have theology like that, you have to explain away the difficulties that we find and then you have to not have just a God creator. You have to have an anti-God that opposes him. And so you have to have something like Satan. Something like a devil. Some anti-God that is responsible for the reverse of it. But if it's all one entity, if there's only one source, if it's true that that entity is the seed for everything, for everything that is manifest, then you have to take it literally. The good with the bad. Of course, good and bad is good and bad as are judged by us. I said so many times before, a crocodile has no idea that pulling your leg and biting it off is good or bad. A shark is tuned to bite. If we happen to put our fl flipper and leg in its mouth, we can't blame the shark and say, sharks are bad and evil and dangerous. Sharks are sharks. Lions are lions. They do what they have to do. Scorpions are scorpions. Snakes are snakes. And we don't like that side of things. We like the cute bunnies and we like the nice squirrels and we like the, you know, the, the cute dogs and the, not just dogs, the puppies. And we like the kittens and the cats, you know, all as we like. We love the, uh, the, the lion cub. But when the lion cub gets a little feisty and rips your skin with its claws, 
lion is a lion, it will behave according to its nature. So we have to be careful of, and be aware, be astutely aware of nature's behavior. It is all one entity. If you have a cat, and you're a cat psychologist, then you will know, do not stroke a cat's tummy. The cat will bite and scratch because it's rolling over saying, I trust you. I trust that you won't touch this vulnerable area of mine. But as soon as you do that, you lost the trust. As soon as you behave in a distrustful way when dealing with pets and animals, then dogs will bite you. But if you behave in a completely trustful way, like one of them, there are so many records of people who have been one with the lions. <coughs> I think this I think he's still alive. I hope so. Maybe he's, by now he's lion food, I have no idea. But, uh, but you see, he, he knows, the, he reads the lion's message or the animal's message. Knowing how to read, he becomes one with them and introduces himself as a lion, even though he may not look like that. The behavior tells it. So, Ishwara's cosmic form is vast. And a cosmic vision to be defined in this chapter, which it is. But one significant thing becomes that the Lord is embodied as time. The whole vastness of time and space is there. Most of what we see in the universe is empty space. The specific gravity of the entire universe is very little, very low. It's very dilute. But what's in between? How vast is this universe? Well, we think it's about 93 billion light years across. Now, you have no idea about that. But you see, a light year is judged by the speed of light. Speed of light, 186,000 miles per second. Now you calculate that into minutes, into hours, into days, into years. You have a vast number. So it's beyond our comprehension. And we've been able to measure this only because we've taken one small picture of the sky over a period of time, some 10 days or so, and seen the various changes and been able to register a small <coughs> post stamp in the sky that size, which is normally to the visible eye vacant, nothing occupying it. When we examine it over a period of time, we see the light within it tells us that there are thousands and thousands of galaxies unnoticed by us. It is said that there are something like 1.2 times 10 to the power of 23, that range to 3 times 10 to the 23 stars existing. That is just a number, but can you imagine now? So, you take 10, and you put 23 knots after it, and you times it by 3. An astronomical amount. 23 knots, if you take a full scale pa paper, some A4 paper, and then put these 23 knots thereafter, and times the whole thing by 3. It's unimaginably vast. We have no idea. Only recently we've had an idea. Only really, from the 1920s, did we have some idea of the vastness of this universe? Even before that, we thought that this was our own galaxy. We never thought that when we looked into the sky, that all the things that are shining are actually other galaxies, vast areas. So, we can calculate, therefore, from the gases and so on and so forth, that in the visible universe, there's something like 10 to the power of 78 to 10 to the power of 82 atoms within the universe. How small is an atom? Well, you can't see it, of course. It's below the visible scale. And we only get an inkling about it. We only know it by its effects. We know we can split it and create a radiation. <coughs> this was discovered eventually 
originator thought the atom was the smallest thing in the universe, that's what atom means. We still have the same concept, a new, very small, tiny thing. But then unfortunately, we know how it can be split and how it can be replaced by radiation. Split the atom, create a big disaster air, a nuclear fallout, radiation everywhere. And radiation is a kind of flux of waves. <coughs> can't pin it down anywhere. More recent research tells us that we have three fundamental atomic components which are fundamental. These are quarks, these are neutrons and electrons. And quarks are parts of protons. Beyond that we don't have anything else. We complete our standard model by introducing Higgs boson that gives everything some mass the fundamental thing are fields. I don't mean strawberry fields or wheat fields or anything like this. I mean vast areas where perturbations exist. The electromagnetic field, for example. The electromagnetic field consists of the electromagnetic wave system and provides us a media for waves to travel at different frequencies and we catch them in different ways. Certain frequencies we'll catch audially. Other frequencies, we have no idea. Gamma waves are beyond our detection. X-rays, normally speaking, are beyond our detection unless we use specific equipment. Ultrasonic is beyond our scope. Subsonic is beyond our scope. Ultraviolet is beyond our scope. Infrared is beyond our scope. But all of this is occurring in the electromagnetic wave system where photons operate and the energy levels are continuously operating. And what is an electron? It's devised, designed, to, defined as <coughs> an excitation in a quantum field. It doesn't help you. We have no idea. We just know that there's something is going on. So how vast is the universe? And how small is the universe? And when you say something like you know, 10 to the power of 82. Again, you put 10, you put 1 with 82 knots. This is a vast area. More than the sand, the grains of sand on a beach. So this vastness was understood there because of this divine vision. Not through scientific endeavor, but through certain divine insight where an inner eye has to be awakened. Naturally, time comes into it, and time is viewed by us as a continuum. But actually, outside of our experience, time has no past, present, or future. And it's damaging for us if we were to have everything revealed in the past and everything revealed to us in the future. Imagine if we knew the future. We'd go half insane. So then in this chapter, naturally, Arjun stands in awe of this with a special insight. And this yields to praise, naturally, as it would for all of us. But then, you see, soon he gets frightened because he sees that all these personalities on the battlefield that he has a conscience about, they're all doomed anyway because clearly he sees into the future. See, from our point of view, past, present, future are defined positions. But in the cosmic area, there's no past, present, or future. What he's seeing is these things devoured by the Lord's teeth, like a huge cosmic monster. Obviously, there's some symbology here, because we can't catch it, because we don't get this insight that he's getting. We can only get his record of it. And so, he pleads, may I see your conventional form? Conventional form not as Krishna. Conventional form as Vishnu, with your four arms and your three heads and so on. Your benign form that we'd like to worship. And then he never realized that Krishna was like this. So he pleads, he begs, forgive me. If I have ever spoken to you in a casual way or anything of this nature. 
So this is an overview of this 11th chapter, which we'll go into in great detail. And the reason why he wants this vision is he has audio evidence of this uh, manifestation, all these manifestations in the 10th chapter. Now he wants to see it for himself. He wants the vision. But of course, be careful what you want, what you ask for. You may regret it. What's the lesson for us? The lesson for us is that while we view this benign aspect, it's not all benign because there's only one existence. Nor is it malicious. Not at all. But the fact of the world is that it is this interplay of these three evolutionary forces of Sattva, Rajas and Tamas. <coughs> and nature is nature. When we know it, we can take the cooperative aspects of it and work with it and control it. And when we know the reverse of it, when we know how, uh, how it is against us, then we can acknowledge it and get around it. A really simple example. See, in the old mining days, you had to get the ore up in a, in a bucket. Actually, in the original mining days, you had to heat the rock, make a fire and a crack in a crevice, heat the rock so it expands, and then chisel away, away at it, and big chunks come away. This is the original system of mining. But then how to take it up to the surface? Fortunately, the surface is not far in the ancient mines, in the ancient workings. So maybe you collect this ore by baskets and hand it one to the other, and so it goes on. But as you go deeper, then you have to take a bucket and then in those days, there's no steam power, so you take a donkey power or horsepower and you bring the ore up there. Of course, when you lower the empty bucket, it's easy because it knows gravity. It takes advantage of gravity's nature's force. This is easy. We can work with it. But when we have to bring it up, nature is against us. We have to work against gravity. So we have to apply specific energy, such as horsepower. And then, of course, when we employ machinery, as our technical knowledge develops, then we use the same expression, horsepower. So man's ingenuity, man's own ingenuity, that is uh, his intellectual horsepower, will now create a machine that uses the horsepower. And so initially it's by steam, steam engines, bring it up, and then the steam engines get replaced by electrical motors. And that's where we are stuck. So knowing how to use nature, knowing its pluses and minuses is useful to us, but it's all one entity. And the lesson for us, as it was in the previous chapter, is that even the things which are destructive, from our point of view, is all part of the cosmic form. There is no separation. You give me this book here. This universe is truly the Divine Person only. Therefore, it subsists on Him, the self-effulgent Divine Being. Self-effulgent, we see things which are lit, but this is self-lit. Who has many heads and many eyes, who is the producer of joy for the universe. There are many chapters in Shastra like this. Who exists in the form of the universe. Don't think there's a universe separate from it who is the master and the cause of humanity, whose forms are the various shining ones, the illuminating factors, who is imperishable, who is the all-surpassing ruler and savior, who is superior to the world, who is endless and omniform, who is the goal of humanity, who is the destroyer of sin and ignorance, who is the protector of the universe and the ruler of individual souls, who is permanent, supremely auspicious and unchanging, 
who has embodied himself in man as his support, who is supremely worthy of being known by the creatures, who is embodied in the universe, and who is the supreme goal, Narayana is the supreme reality designated as Brahman. He is the highest self, supreme light, infinite self, most excellent meditator and meditation. Whatsoever there is in this world, known through perception or known through report, all that is pervaded by Narayana within and without. One should meditate upon the supreme, the limitless, unchanging, all-knowing cause of the happiness of the world, dwelling in the seer one's own heart as the goal of all striving. The place for his meditation is the ether in the heart, the heart which is comparable to an inverted lotus. This heart which is located at the distance of a finger span below the Adam's apple and above the navel is the great abode of the universe. Like the bud of a lotus suspends in an inverted position the heart surrounded by arteries. In it there is a narrow space. In it everything is supported. In the middle of that remains the undecaying, all-knowing, omnifaced, great fire which has flames on every side, which enjoys the food presented before it, which remains assimilating the food consumed, the rays of which scattering themselves vertically and horizontally and which warms its own body from the insole to the crown. In the center of the fire, which permeates the whole body, there abides a tongue of fire of the color of shining gold, which is the topmost among the subtle, which is dazzling like the flash of the lightning, that appears in the middle of a rain-bearing cloud, which is as slender as the horn of a paddy grain, and which serves as a comparison to illustrate subtlety. Paramatman dwells in the middle of that flame. Although he is thus limited, still he has, as he is the four-faced creator, Shiva, Vishnu, Indra, the material and efficient cause of the universe, and the supreme self-luminous pure consciousness. This is the most beautiful Narayana Suktam, ancient in its composition, and it tells us in a very clever way the importance of studying this chapter, that we're going from the outside and gradually going to inside. This is meditation. Meditation is picking up all these external examples and step by step bringing them into our own awareness and then bringing it into our own internal being until we discover that entity that is there in, through, as and beyond this cosmic universe, this cosmic being that we call this Purusha that we call this cosmic form, or that we call in religious parts God. But God is such a short term, this term. It doesn't give us the full purport of this. And so when we use this term or similar terms, we should be careful not have the verbal delusion about it and understand the depths of meaning and existence in it.